Frances Marion Parker was born October 11, 1915, in Los Angeles, California, to Geraldine and Perry Marion Parker. She had a twin sister, Marjorie, and one older brother, Perry Jr. Parker went missing from Mount Vernon Junior High School in the Lafayette Square section of Los Angeles on December 15, 1927. She was excused from class by the registrar, Mary Holt, after a man, presenting himself as an employee of the bank where Perry Parker worked, claimed that Perry had suffered an automobile accident and wished to see his daughter. The man, apparently unaware of Marion's twin sister, Marjorie, was given possession of Marion. Holt later claimed that she never would have let Marion go but for the apparent sincerity and disarming manner of the man. Parker was reported missing later that day. The next day, December 16th, the first of several ransom letters were delivered via telegram to the Parker home, demanding $1,500 and $20 gold certificates. All communications by the kidnapper were signed with names such as Fate, Death, and The Fox. The first telegram, addressed from Pasadena, read, Do positively nothing till you receive a special delivery letter, with what appeared to be Marion's signature on it. A second telegram, sent shortly after, read, Marion Secure. Use good judgment. Interference with my plans dangerous. This telegram was signed with the name George Fox. In another of the successive telegrams, it was indicated that no one will ever see the girl again except the angels in heaven. This letter, signed Fate, also had the Greek word for death written at the top. Through the telegram correspondence, a meeting location was established in the late hours of December 16th for Perry Parker to exchange the ransom. Prior to departing, Perry recorded the serial numbers of each of the bills so they could be identified when used in future exchanges, allowing authorities to track the kidnapper. Perry arrived at the location alone with the ransom money at approximately 8 p.m. and was confronted by the kidnapper only moments after arriving. The assailant, driving a Chrysler Coupe, pulled up next to Perry's vehicle and held him at gunpoint with a sawed-off shotgun. The unknown man had a bandana covering most of his face. During the exchange, Perry was able to see Marion seated in the passenger seat of the car, concealed up to her neck by clothing, but not visibly moving. When he called out to her, she did not respond, though her eyes were visibly open. Perry assumed that she had been drugged. As soon as the money was handed over, the assailant put his vehicle into gear moving forward and pushed Marion's body out of the car before speeding away. Some reports state the assailant commented, there's your daughter, before throwing the body onto the street. Realizing his daughter was dead, Perry phoned authorities. After her body was recovered from the street, an autopsy was completed on the remains at approximately 9 p.m. The coroner indicated that Marion had been dead for approximately 12 hours, her arms and legs had been cut off, and she had been disemboweled. Her lower torso stuffed with a towel and a man's shirt. Marion's eyes had been held open with piano wire to give the appearance that she was still alive. The following morning, December 15th, a man on a morning walk in Elysian Park found the severed arms and legs of a child, each wrapped in newspaper, lying in disarray on the street. Upon recovering the limbs, police positively identified them as belonging to Marion. A massive manhunt for Marion's killer began on December 17, 1927. It involved over 20,000 police officers and American Legion volunteers. A reward of 50000 was offered for the identification and capture of the killer, dead or alive. This was later raised to 100000 after numerous contributions from the public. On December 20th, the getaway car in which Marion's killer had departed was found abandoned and identified as having been stolen in San Diego. Fingerprints were able to be taken from the door of the car. Several suspects were considered at the time, including Earl Smith, the son of a local dentist, and Louis H. Wyatt, who was apprehended and interviewed in Las Vegas, Nevada but they were cleared of suspicion after Mary Holt, the registrar who had spoken with Marion's abductor, confirmed that neither were the same man. Police traced a laundry mark on the towel found stuffed inside Marion's torso to the Bellevue Arms apartment where they interviewed a number of tenants. On December 20th, the fingerprints taken from the abandoned Chrysler were identified as belonging to William Edward Hickman, a former co-worker of Perry Parker. Both men were employed by the First National Bank of Los Angeles, where Perry worked as an assistant cashier and Hickman as an officer. The year prior, Hickman had been arrested on a complaint made by Perry regarding stolen forged checks totaling $400. Hickman was convicted and sentenced to probation, after which he spent six months living with family in Kansas City, Missouri, before returning to Los Angeles. Additional fingerprints lifted from the ransom letters were able to be positively identified as Hickman's. 
It was subsequently uncovered that Hickman had been a new resident of the Bellevue Arms, having moved into the building under the alias Donald Evans. Upon examination of Hickman's apartment, bloody footprints were discovered, evidence of a crime. Additionally, police found partly burnt handwritten drafts of ransom letters regarding Parker, as well as newspaper clippings about the Parker kidnapping. Residents of the Bellevue Arms told police that during their initial comb of the building, Hickman had not been home and hence had not been encountered by law enforcement. Additionally, a janitor in the building reported that he had witnessed Hickman carrying several packages to his car on the night of December 16th and observing him wiping down the seat of his car the following day. Identifying Hickman as the prime suspect in Marion Parker's murder, law enforcement traced his path north as he fled to Oregon. He was sighted by a gas station attendant in Albany on the morning of December 20th, driving a green Hudson car later determined to have been stolen in Los Angeles. According to the station attendant, Hickman was dressed in a dark blue suit and wore Oxford shoes. The attendant reported the sighting to police the next day after reading the newspaper article indicating that Hickman was most likely driving a green Hudson vehicle. Police were subsequently able to trace Hickman to Seattle, Washington where he used two of the $20 gold certificates given to him as part of Perry Parker's ransom to purchase clothes from a haberdashery on the evening of December 21st. Around 6.30 a.m. on December 22nd, Fred King, a gas station proprietor in Portland, spotted Hickman at his service station, where he was again purchasing gasoline. King immediately reported the sighting to police, indicating that Hickman had driven away from the service station east in the direction of the Columbia River Gorge. A bulletin was posted following King's report, and officers were stationed on all roads leading east of Portland. Hickman later admitted that before departing Portland, he disposed of his California license plates, replacing them with two Washington license plates he had stolen from a car in Olympia the day before. At approximately 1.30 p.m. on December 22, 1927, Chief of Police Tom Gurdon and Traffic Officer Buck Leanne arrested Hickman in Echo, Oregon. After a frantic car chase, the officers had recognized him from the wanted posters. In the Green Hudson, the officers discovered $1,400 of the gold ransom given to him from Perry. At the time of his arrest, Hickman proclaimed, Some fiend killed her. I don't know who he is. Before stating, I did it because I wanted the money to pay my way through college. While detained in Umatilla County Jail in Pendleton, Oregon, Hickman confessed to helping participate in Parker's kidnapping, but implicated two men's brothers, Oliver and Frank Kramer, as accomplices who carried out the murder. Hickman relayed an extensive story to a journalist from the East Oregonian, in which he claimed to have participated in a kidnapping ransom plot with the Kramers. Hickman claimed to have spent time with Marion Parker, even having taken her to see Figures Don't Lie at the Rialto Theater. He took responsibility for the telegrams and phone calls, but claimed that it was the Kramers who actually carried out Parker's murder. Police, however, determined this to be impossible, as the Kramer brothers had been incarcerated for several months on other charges. It was subsequently determined that Hickman knew the Kramer brothers through one of their girlfriends, with whom Hickman was acquainted. Aware that both of the men had criminal histories, police surmised that Hickman attempted to implicate them on this basis but authorities assured the public they were satisfied that neither but authorities assured the public that they were satisfied that neither of the Kramer men nor their girlfriends were aware or involved in Parker's abduction or murder additionally Hickman at first denied having committed the murder in his apartment in the Bellevue Arms despite the discovery of blood evidence there captain bright of the pendleton police department commented hickman said the Parker girl was not killed in the Bellevue Arms apartment house. We know that she was killed there. If his statement is wrong in that, it is discredited in other details. Hickman was extradited to Los Angeles, where he confessed to another unrelated murder, which he had committed during a drugstore holdup. He also confessed to having committed a number of other armed robberies. In subsequent correspondence, authorities were able to coax further details about Parker's murder, which Hickman disclosed via written confession after realizing his claims regarding the Kramer brothers had been disproven. In his apartment at the Bellevue Arms, Hickman admitted to having strangled Parker, whom he had blindfolded and tied to a chair, until she was unconscious. He proceeded to hang Parker's body upside down in his bathtub, slicing her throat at the jugular vein to drain the body of blood. After disarticulating her arms and legs, he proceeded to disembowel her, during which he stated, The body jerked with such force that it flew out of the tub, 
suggesting that she might have still been alive during the dismemberment. Hickman subsequently wrapped Parker's limbs in newspapers before temporarily storing her torso in a suitcase. He then left the apartment to see a film, but claimed that he was unable to focus on the feature and wept throughout. Later that night, realizing that Parker's father might want to physically see his daughter before paying the ransom, Hickman attempted to reconstruct and disguise Marion's body to make it appear that she was alive, leading him to adorn her with makeup and sew her eyes open with wire. Reflecting on the entire ordeal, Hickman told police, she felt perfectly safe and the tragedy was so sudden and unexpected that I'm sure she never actually suffered through the whole affair, except for a little sobbing which she couldn't keep back for her father and mother. Hickman told his attorney that he had killed Parker upon the direction of a supernatural deity he called Providence. This claim was touted by Hickman's defense attorney in court, who attempted to explain Hickman's actions by reason of insanity. The defense professed that Hickman was mentally ill and deeply influenced by his religious zealot grandfather who had exposed him to frenzied religious exorcisms. Hickman was one of the first defendants to use California's new law that allowed pleas of not guilty by reason of insanity. Despite having initially told police that he needed the 1500 ransom to attend Park College, a Bible college in Kansas City, evidence contradicting his insanity defense concluded Evidence contradicting his insanity defense included testimony from prison guards at the Umatilla County Jail in Oregon, who stated that Hickman had asked them how he could act crazy during his incarceration. Dr. W.D. McCary, a Pendleton psychologist who examined Hickman at the Umatilla County Jail, observed that his mind seemed clear, as he told a straight, coherent story and was never at a loss for words. There was nothing about him to indicate insanity. He says that he does not like girls and that he is deeply religious and that his ambition was to become a minister. Several times he made mentions of God. Prosecutors speculated that Hickman wanted revenge against Parker for having testified against him in his earlier trial for the theft and forgery. There is evidence that Hickman committed the murder in part for the notoriety it would bring him. As he divulged to one reporter that he wanted as much press coverage as was received by the high-profile killers Leopold and Loeb. In February 1928, a jury rejected the insanity defense, and the judge sentenced Hickman to death by hanging. He appealed his conviction, but it was upheld by the California Supreme Court. During his final months, Hickman reportedly embraced Roman Catholicism and wrote letters of apologies to his victims' families. On October 19, 1928, he was hanged on the gallows in San Quentin Prison. Upon falling through the trapdoor of the gallows, Hickman struck his head and hung, violently twitching and jerking. According to witnesses, it took approximately two minutes for Hickman to die. An autopsy performed after his execution showed that Hickman's neck did not break during the hanging and that he died from asphyxiation. <laughs>